Hello everyone, both in the room and online. And it's such a pleasure to be here. It's a long way from London to Beijing. I'm so grateful to Tencent for their very kind invitation to join you and also for their wonderful hospitality. I've never been to Beijing before and I've seen some wonderful things and eaten some wonderful food. So thank you very much. Can we cure aging? We've certainly been very good at lengthening our lives. Um, the, the, our lifespans have been increasing very steadily, pretty much worldwide, since the middle of the 19th century. So this is illustrated here by some data from um, the Netherlands, and what you've got is the years 1850, 1900, and 1950, and these are the survival curves, the proportion of people left alive at each date. And what you can see is the, the big uplift in the survival curve over that period. Um, our lives have been increasing at an astonishing six hours a day, two and a half years per decade, over that period. And at first, the increase was in the younger section of the population, so less infant mortality, deaths of small children, uh, due to clean water, better food supply, better hygiene, and so on. Then um, protection against infectious diseases came in, and now the increase is happening mainly in the older section of the population, thanks to improving medical care. So obviously, this is something to celebrate. We're keeping ourselves in better health at each age, and so we're living longer. And it's leading to some remarkable lifespans. As far as I know, this lady is the, she's certainly the official world record holder, a French woman. She was born in the south of France, and she died at the age of 122 and a half, approximately, in 1997. And I don't think anyone really knows what her secret was, why no one has exceeded her record since then. She came from um, quite a long-lived family, and there is a slight genetic basis uh, to human longevity. It's not a very strong one, but it's there. On the other hand, she really wasn't a very good you know, advertisement for the kind of healthy lifestyle we might expect to see with this great feat. She actually only gave up smoking just before she died, so it's really not clear what her secret was. And this is true generally of very long-lived humans. They seem almost to survive to great ages despite their lifestyle rather than because of it. Uh, this is the picture for life expectancy in China since 1990. So this is life expectancy now. That's the length of time that the average person is expected to live. And you can see the steady increase. It's uh, women on the top, men below. It becomes fuzzy after the present point, of course, because we don't know what's going to happen in the way of you know, future waves of infectious diseases, other things that may happen. But if things stay as they are, that's the projection through to 2035 for Chinese life expectancy. So a 10-year increase, approximately, over that period. And women live longer than men do in China and everywhere else in the world. Um, but these, unfortunately, are not healthy extra years. Women tend to suffer a longer period of loss of function and ill health at the end of life than men do. And that's just the tip of a very general problem, which is this one. Essentially, our health span, the length of time that we stay healthy and functional, before the first age-related disease occurs, is not keeping up with the increase in lifespan. So there's a growing period of frailty, disability, illness, loss of quality of life at the end of life, which is a big problem for economic systems, medical care systems, and of course, older people themselves, because that's where the major burden of ill health is now falling. So should we cure aging? I think there's an absolute imperative that we should try to keep people healthier for longer before they die. The aim of the kind of research that I and many other people do isn't to make people live longer. As I've shown you, that's happening already without any intervention from people like me. The aim is to try and squash that period of loss of quality of life at the end of life. And I think a lot of people tend to regard aging as, oh, just natural. But actually, I think it's part of quite widespread ageist attitudes in our society that we take it for granted that old people are going to get ill. 
So what if we didn't? What if getting old didn't mean getting ill? There are some creatures that don't seem to age at all. Um, three of them are shown here, a sea anemone, the hydra, and planarian worm. All fairly simple structured organisms. They show no sign whatsoever as they go through their lives of either becoming more likely to die or less able to reproduce. They just keep going. And an interesting thing about all three of them is that they contain a lot of undifferentiated cells, these stem cells, that can divide and regenerate tissues. And they all have very high regenerative capacity. And this may have some bearing um, on the reason that they don't seem to show aging. But as well as these rather spectacular creatures, we've also found, really over the last two or three decades, that aging is an extraordinarily malleable process. So if you take a rat or a mouse or many other organisms and simply put them on a diet so you give them less to eat than they would choose to eat if you allowed them to decide for themselves, then what you very generally see is an often quite marked increase in lifespan, but also an astonishingly broad spectrum improvement in the health of the animals. So very recently in the US, some experiments of this kind have been completed with rhesus monkeys, very long lived, they can live up to 40 years. And these are just some of the things, some of the health improvements that were shown in the aging restricted monkeys. There's one on the right there and a control animal on the left. And you can see that they're protected against the major chronic diseases of aging, metabolic disease, cardiovascular disease, cancer, neurodegeneration, and also show great improvements in function, you know, better muscle function, physical activity, better immunity, and so on. So this is an extraordinarily powerful intervention. In fact, it's still the most powerful one that we've got for keeping animals healthy as they age. Of course, what we're really interested in here is people, and there are very good indications that dietary restriction actually works in humans too. There have been some proper clinical trials of dietary restriction, again, um, conducted in the United States. It was interesting that very few of the potential subjects for these trials could comply with the dietary restriction regime. There was a big dropout rate and they could only um, decrease their food intake by about 10%. The monkeys, for instance, could do 30%. But even so, they were clear um, markers of improved health, especially cardiovascular markers. And still, if we want to keep ourselves healthy as aged, the, the main thing that we can do is to have a healthy lifestyle, a good diet, not too much food, plenty of exercise, good sleep, not too much stress. You know, all the things that your mother told you, those are still our most powerful interventions. But people with a completely blameless lifestyle nonetheless get the ills of old age because we're now living so long. So we would like to understand more about the detailed mechanisms of the aging process so that perhaps we could target it pharmacologically or in other ways to try and keep people healthy. In humans, there is one um, pair, clear pair of genetic syndromes. Mercifully, they're extremely rare, but they're premature aging syndromes. So in these two, the children show the features of aging while they're still children. The most severe one is the one on the left here, hutchinson guilford progeria. So those children are normal till they're about 18 months old. Then they start to lose hair, subcutaneous fat, and they die usually in their teens of cardiovascular disease, so they show many of the features of normal aging. Less severe is Werner's syndrome, which has an onset in the teens, and people carrying that mutation um, usually make it through into their 40s or so. And again, some of the features, but not all of them, people with Werner's syndrome tend to die either of cancer or of cardiovascular disease. And I do think these tragic syndromes tell us two very important things. Both of them in, are lesions in genes that maintain the genetic material in the cells of organisms. Um, so what's going wrong in both of them is that there's damage to the genetic material. It's either not properly packaged in the nucleus or not replicated properly in the case of Werner's syndrome. So that suggests that genome maintenance during aging is very important. 
but they also hold the promise that perhaps we could find genes that do, or mutations that do the opposite, that actually increase health during aging. And for these, for that, that question, these have been the real um, work causes. They're the work causes of most of modern biology, the budding yeast, nematode worm, uh, Drosophila, and the mouse. And they've, been, they've told us an awful lot about what we know about the aging process. And it started with a really prescient experiment from somebody called Cynthia Kenyon. This really blew open the field. And what she did was to simply say, can I find a mutant worm that lives longer than the normal control wild-type worm? So she was screening for lifespan. And she found a staggeringly long-lived mutant shown here. It's called DAF2. I'll come to that in a minute. So it's the turquoise line. This is a survival curve. And what you can see is that this mutant's living almost twice as long as the wild type. And very importantly, it's a healthy increase. So the mutant worms were wriggling around and healthy long after the controls were dead. And in fact, if you combine that mutation with other mutations that model human age-related diseases, so there are worm models of cancer and of neurodegeneration, if you put the DAF2 mutant in, it rescues a lot of the pathology. So a very, very powerful mutant indeed. And it eventually turned out to be a lesion in the single worm insulin, insulin-like growth factor receptor, much better known in mammals, of course, for control of metabolism or control of growth and wound healing, but now the whole thing turning up in the worm and associated with aging. And what this is part of is a good times signaling network in cells. It's a system that cells have for sensing whether everything's okay. Is there plenty of food? Are there stresses? If yes to the first, no to the second, fine, off we go. Let's signal, grow, reproduce, metabolize, do whatever we like. But if there's a food shortage or signs of stress, then the signaling goes down and other molecules become activated and switch on genes that are important in stress resistance. So what we've got here is a worm that thinks there's something wrong when there isn't, and it's turned on its stress resistance system in response. And amazingly, this turns out to be evolutionarily conserved in the other organisms. So these are just data. We've got the worm again on the left, but on the right now we've got the fly and the mouse, both carrying similar mutations, and you can see in both cases really quite dramatically extending the lifespan of the animal. And again, it's a healthy increase. So quite a lot of work's been done on this, this mouse, looking what happens to it as it ages. Um, so it's shown in this diagram here, you've got the mutant mouse on the left and the um, control on the right. These are sister mice. They're about 850 days old when this photograph was taken. And you can see the very broad spectrum improvement, you know, metabolic, immune, motor, bones with osteoporosis, um, cataracts in the eye, you can see one on the control mouse there. And also that, that condition on the skin, the ulcerative dermatitis on the neck of the mouse. And the mutant is protected against all of these during aging. So again, it's rather like dietary restriction, very broad spectrum improvement in health during aging, as though you've hit the underlying aging process itself. A lot of work's now being done on whether some of the things that are being discovered in the animal models are also present in long-lived humans. So people study genetically either whole families who are long-lived or sporadic individuals who manage to make it to great ages, 90, 100, 110, and so on. And very interestingly, one bit of this network has turned up um, consistently in those studies. So what you're looking at here is 11 of the human chromosomes. We have 23 chromosomes. Um, this is 11 of them. And it's simply showing that after all this work, this FOXO3A is one of these molecules that's activated when signaling goes down to turn on stress resistance genes. That's what it does. It's a transcription factor. And it turns out that genetic variants in it in the population have now turned out to be associated with extreme longevity in seven different population studies. It turns up in a meta-analysis. So it really does look as though these discoveries from the animals, at least some of them, are going through to humans. And as a result of a lot of work of this general kind in animals and also in humans themselves, 
I think we now have a pretty good idea of what goes wrong during ageing, what our potential targets are. And they've become known as the hallmarks of ageing. They're shown in this uh, wheel on the right here. And I think most people think that the process probably kicks off with the, what I was saying about those um, premature ageing syndromes, things going wrong with the genetic material itself. And that means that processes in cells controlled by genes, so the proteins in the cells, the organelles, the substructures of the cells that do important things, gradually become dysfunctional. And as a result, the cells themselves start to behave badly. So stem cells don't divide when they should, or they divide when they shouldn't to make the wrong kind of cell. You get these rather toxic senescent cells accumulating in tissues. There's growing inflammation generally during aging, probably in response to the other things that are going wrong in the body. And also, of course, there are many uh, microorganisms associated with other or organisms, particularly in the gut, but also on the skin. And they're normally very carefully controlled by the immune system, but that also goes wrong during aging. So these are the hallmarks. They interact with each other. They're not independent. One can often lead to another. But what's really important about them is that they're all present in the route to one or more aging-related diseases. So most diseases are aging-related. Um, a recent survey said 207 out of 284 diseases with an ICD code are related to age. They're more common in older people. And these hallmarks are present in the roots that eventually lead to an outright clinical state. So there are potential targets. I think the big notion in the field now, in many, many labs around the world, is that we should be targeting these directly. And this is really the geroscience approach. So the idea is that rather than the current practice, which is extraordinarily effective, and I'm sure will continue to be extraordinarily effective, where what we do is wait for a particular disease, cancer or cardiovascular disease to occur, and then we try to treat it. I am aware that Chinese medicine takes a slightly different approach to some of these things, by the way. But in Western medicine, this is a very typical approach. You wait for something to go wrong, and then you try to fix it. And a specialist in what's gone wrong is the person who fixes it, and research on it goes on in a single research institute somewhere. But I think there is another way of looking at things, uh, which is that we can intervene in the underlying aging process itself. Sorry, I'm messing the slides up. I think there's a, a lesion with the slides. I'm sorry, there's one that won't show. Um, but what it's showing is that if we intervene in those underlying aging hallmarks, that circle, if we actually tackle them, then what we can do is to delay or prevent um, multiple aging-related diseases simultaneously. So the key concept here is that we're talking about prevention rather than treatment. And because there are rather few aging hallmarks and an awful lot of age-related diseases, we're probably uh, talking about intervening um, in one hallmark to prevent multiple diseases. So it's prevention and several diseases rather than waiting for a disease and treating it. And I think this could be um, a very powerful way forward. Now, people might say, well, I don't want to take a pill just to prevent something happening. And that's, of course, a perfectly reasonable point of view. But I would like to point out that that's exactly what an awful lot of us are doing already. So if you think about cardiovascular disease, the incidence has gone down dramatically in the last 20 years. Part of that's lifestyle, but an awful lot of it is partly these guys, the, the statins, um, these drugs that prevent atherosclerosis, the cl clogging up plaques in the arteries. Um, there are also drugs that lower blood pressure that's not at pathological limits, but brings it down. And these between them are taken very safely by millions of people worldwide. And they've had this huge impact on the incidence of heart disease. So the precedent is there. These are very safe drugs that are taken for a very long time by millions of people. All that's changing here is the suggestion that they might be used to target aging. 
Developing a new drug for aging would probably be a challenge. Um, you're talking about treating a lot of people for a very long time, very expensive clinical trials. Pharma might not be uh, so interested in the cost of that. And there'd be very important regulatory issues as well. At the moment, aging is not recognized as a disease. And of course, safety would be an issue. But all the indications are that many drugs out there could be repurposed, could be redirected to acting as geroprotectors. Because, as I've said, these hallmarks are present in the route to disease. So there are many existing drugs that already target them without having been developed with that particular approach in mind. One of them is this one, uh, rapamycin. It targets that good times network that I was talking about. It's used as a cancer chemotherapeutic and to prevent organ transplant rejection. Um, particularly kidneys, it was actually discovered on Easter Island. It's a natural product of the bacteria there. And you can see that fed orally to mice, it produces a quite dramatic dose-dependent increase in lifespan. And again, like that mutant mouse I showed you earlier, you see a really broad spectrum improvement in health in response to treatment with this drug. And drugs like it are the ones that are moving furthest forward in clinical trials and practice in humans now. Um, this is just shown here by the work of, of Joan Manick. Um, what she's done is to take a specific indication, which is the response of old people to immunization against flu, which is normally a weak response. And what she's done is to pre-treat them with a drug like rapamycin and then immunize them. And what she found was the immune response was boosted and there were fewer respiratory infections in the ensuing winter. And I think that's the way these drugs are going to come in. They're out there already, and they will gradually be repurposed for specific indications, and so their use will be broadened. And in this trial, she could use a much, much lower dose than would be used therapeutically for cancer or kidney rejection. There were no side effects in her clinical trial, and it was only a few weeks of treatment. So I think the road is open. So I've hugely enjoyed my own research journey um, in ageing research. I think we really can look forward to the prospect that we may be able to prevent some of these diseases rather than wait for them to happen, uh, with a poly pill probably, because there are several different mechanisms of ageing. There are loads of ageing research labs starting in China now and some established ones. Um, it's really wonderful to see the work that's coming out from this part of the world, and I hope perhaps some of you might be encouraged to go into it. So we're living much, much longer than in our evolutionary past. Our bodies aren't equipped to deal with the challenges that they face at later ages, and they just need a bit of health in, help in this world of longevity. Thank you.